Key Insights from Chapter 1 Number 1. People think the problem in America is class. Key Insights from Chapter 1 Number 1. People think the problem in America is class and not race. However, that is ill-informed. Number 2. Black people in America are still left behind by the labor movements that manage to benefit white Americans much more than them, despite promising equality. Number 3. Race is a social construct. It is a lie told to justify the crime of slavery. The economic system built on it is a promise that white people will get more because people of color will get less. Number 4. Classism is definitely a problem that should be dealt with. However, other problems exist, such as racism, and each requires a certain way to be dealt with. Number 5. If a person of color says something is about race, it's valid because of their lived experience. Even if someone is not thinking of race when they act a certain way, their race influences the way they act. Number 6. If something disproportionately or differently affects people of color, it is about race. It doesn't mean that it doesn't also affect white people, but it does so in different ways. Number 7. Something is about race if it fits into a broader pattern of events that disproportionately or differently affect people of color. Number 8. While just about everything can be about race, almost nothing is exclusively about race because we live in a complex world. Key Insights from Chapter 2 Number 1. It's hard for black people to talk about day-to-day -day racism and its impact on their life because white people tend to put their comfort over black people's safety. Number 2. There are a lot of people who don't hate other races, but they still benefit from a racist system that gives them more power and resources than people of other races. Number 3. Systemic racism is a machine that runs whether we pull the levers or not, and by just letting it be, we are responsible for what it produces. We have to actually dismantle the machine if we want to make change. Number 4. If you think racism is just about being mean to people, you're missing the bigger picture. We cannot fix these systemic issues on a purely emotional basis. Number 5. Tying racism to its systemic causes and effects will help others see the important difference between systemic racism and anti-white bigotry. Key Insights from Chapter 3 Number 1. Tough conversations about race can open up a new way of seeing each other and how we can truly come together and understand each other better. Number 2. Most of the time, white people don't want to talk about race because they are afraid they will say something wrong and get in trouble, but talking about race is necessary if we want to end it. Number 3. Even if you're going to screw up, you should still talk to people about race. Number 4. If you're trying to understand racism, don't let your emotions get in the way of that. Don't get defensive and try to be understanding. Number 5. If you're going to talk about something you don't know about, look it up. Don't hold up conversations while you ask people to explain things to you. Number 6. Don't make your anti-racism argument oppressive against other groups. Number 7. When you start to feel defensive, stop and ask yourself what that says about you. If you can't, take a few minutes away to avoid further miscommunication. Number 8. If you are white, watch how many times you say I and me. Remember, systemic racism is about more than individuals, and it is not about your personal feelings. Number 9. If you're trying to prove you're right, you're not going to learn anything. If you're trying to do better, you'll learn a lot. Number 10. Don't force people of color to talk about race, because it's painful and exhausting. Number 11. Sometimes you're going to say something that is wrong, and it is going to hurt someone. When that happens, apologize, and try to make things better. Number 12. If you can see where you screwed up, where you made assumptions, where you got overly defensive, where you hurt someone, own up and say sorry and mean it. Number 13. Don't insist that people give you credit for your intentions. If you screwed up and you hurt people, your good intentions won't lessen that hurt. Number 14. Don't beat yourself up. It's natural to feel frustrated when you aren't communicating as effectively as you need to. But you can and will do better if you learn from this experience. Number 15. Don't be afraid of getting it wrong. Keep trying to get it right. Number 16. Racism upsets us because it exists, not because we talk about it. If you are white and you don't want to feel any part of that pain by having these conversations, then you're asking people of color to continue to bear the entire burden of racism alone.
Key insights from Chapter 4. Number 1. Black people may forget the financial and educational privileges that they have over other, worse off, black people. Number 2. Privilege, in the social justice context, is an advantage or a set of advantages that you have that others do not. Number 3. If I don't acknowledge my privilege, I would then be perpetuating the same advantages and disadvantages, or system of privilege, on other people. Number 4. When people ask you to check your privilege, they are asking you to think about how your race, gender, sexuality, and other things have given you advantages in life that other people may not have had. Number 5. When we're willing to admit that we have privileges, we can use those privileges to help other people who don't have the same privileges. Number 6. Even if someone confronts you with your privilege from a place of hatred, remember that the alternative is your continued participation in the oppression of others. Number 7. Once you are aware of your privilege, you can get to work on dismantling it to make change toward a better world. Key Insights from Chapter 5 Number 1. Intersectionality is the belief that our social justice movements must consider all of the intersections of identity privilege, and oppression that people face in order to be just and effective. Number 2. People of different races, genders, sexualities, and classes have different experiences of life. We walk through the world with all our identities at once, so there's an endless number of possible scenarios that could happen daily. Number 3. Intersectionality helps ensure that fewer people are left behind and that our efforts to do better for some do not make things far worse for others. Number 4. Social justice movements have been slow to adopt intersectional practices because intersectionality slows things down, brings people face-to-face -face with their privilege, and forces people to interact with, listen to, and consider people they otherwise wouldn't need to. Number 5. If you want to fight any form of oppression, you have to look at how those forms of oppression interact with each other and take steps to make yourself and others aware of this oppression. Number 6. The people who want to be in charge of social justice movements need to make sure all the people who are being helped by the social justice movement are included in the decisions about how to help these people. Key Insights from Chapter 6 Number 1. Black people are more likely to be stopped by police, searched, arrested, and killed. Number 2. The police in the United States have a long history of oppressing people of color for the benefit of the rich white folk. Number 3. Historically, the police were created to control black people, not to protect them. They're taught to treat black people as criminals and trained to put them down. Number 4. People of color do need and desperately want an effective police force to help keep their communities safe. They need different policing that is not steeped in the need to control people of color. Number 5. People of color are not asking white people to fear the police as much as people of color do. They are asking white people to join them in demanding their right to be able to trust the police. Key Insights from Chapter 7 For many young black boys, emotionality and energy had been misinterpreted as aggression and lack of intelligence. Number 2. In many companies, employees of color commonly feel exploited and unappreciated and receive less wages. Number 3. White people in positions of power are often quick to dismiss any complaint from people of color as a misunderstanding. Number 4. While the social media age has pushed black and brown voices forward, the people who held the important publishing and editing jobs were still predominantly white. Number 5. There are people who have to work extra hard to succeed because they are black or non-privileged in general, which is not fair. Number 6. Affirmative action is a way to make sure that people who have been discriminated against get a fair shot at jobs and education. Racist people want it rolled back, but it's necessary because it values equality and diversity. Number 7. Opponents of affirmative action say it is unfair because it gives an advantage to people who are not as qualified. But that's not true, because they would simply fail and be forced to leave their position if they weren't. Number 8. The argument that affirmative action is unnecessary because today's world is less racist or sexist is wrong, as easily proven by statistics showing the wage and education gaps. Number 9. There are systemic issues keeping women and people of color from being hired into jobs, promoted, paid a fair wage, and accepted into college, which is why affirmative action is not unfair but merely an attempt to remedy this. Number 10. 
Affirmative action has been proven to work by the multiple statistics showing its effects in colleges and workplaces. However, it's not enough, and systemic change still needs to take place. It is not the final answer to racism, but it helps a lot. Key Insights from Chapter 8 Number 1. The school system is marginalizing and criminalizing our black and brown kids in large numbers. It's called the school-to-prison pipeline because it's a system that funnels people of color from our schools into our prison industrial complex. Number 2. While many teachers do contribute to the problems that black and brown children face, there are many other contributing factors to the disenfranchisement and criminalization of our youth in schools. Number 3. The factors that contribute to the school-to-prison pipeline are racial bias of school administrators and teachers, lack of cultural sensitivity for children of color, zero-tolerance policies that suspend students for trivial behaviors, and increased police presence in schools, which increases student arrests. Number 4. To address the issue of school-to-prison pipelines, we can include it more in our general discussions about race, talk to schools and school boards about it, and recognize the achievements of black and brown children instead of focusing on the negatives. Number 5. To address the issue of school-to-prison pipelines, we should increase the representation of black and brown children, challenge language that stereotypes black and brown kids, and discuss deeper causes of defiant and antisocial behavior in black and brown youth. Number 6. The biggest tragedy of the school-to-prison pipeline is that children of color are robbed of their childhoods. They do not get to be carefree kids like others can, and we should help save them as soon as possible. Key Insights from Chapter 9 Number 1. The words nigger and cracker have different histories. The word nigger was a use used by white people to oppress black people. The word cracker was never used to oppress white people. Number 2. People of color have inherited the pain of racially oppressive words, a direct result of how these words were used in the past. White people who continue to use those words are still benefiting from the oppression created by these words, while people of color still suffer. Number 3. People of color who've never had the power to oppress are able to use oppressive words without invoking the impression that those words carry. However, when white people use those words, they do invoke that oppression because they have benefited from it. Key Insights from Chapter 10 Number 1. Cultural appropriation is when someone from a dominant culture takes something from a minority culture and uses it for their own benefit. Number 2. The ways that white people use black art, music, etc are often to their own benefit and at the expense of black people. Number three. Until we do live in a society that equally respects all cultures, any attempts of the dominant culture to borrow from marginalized cultures will run the risk of being exploitative and insulting. Number four. A dominant culture shouldn't just take and enjoy and profit from the beauty and art and creation of an oppressed culture without taking on any of the pain and oppression people of that culture had to survive while creating it. Key Insights from Chapter 11 Number 1. Little black girls are taught that their hair was undesirable, and the only way to be beautiful was to have long straight hair like white girls. This could cause them to damage it with chemicals. Number 2. Hair can be a tool of oppression to belittle black women. Number 3. Hair touching is wrong because it's non-consensual, weird, unhygienic, and is a continuation of the lack of respect for the basic humanity and bodily autonomy of black Americans that is endemic throughout white supremacy. Number four. If you are not black and are curious about black hair, educate yourself and ask about it. Don't touch without permission, because that's not only rude, but also reaffirms the slavery notion that black people do not own their bodies and are free to be manipulated. Key Insights from Chapter 12 Number 1. Microaggressions are small things that people say to you that add up over time and make you feel bad and less than. They are often said by people who don't necessarily mean to hurt you. Number 2. Microaggressions are a serious problem beyond the emotional and physical effects they have on the person they are perpetrated against. They normalize racism. Number 3. When someone does something that hurts your feelings, it can be hard to tell them. What you can do is ask what they meant by it. Let them know why what they said is wrong and emphasize that their intentions are not the point. Number four. If you are a person of color, you have the right to call out microaggressions against you. If someone calls you out, they aren't oversensitive. They are standing up for themselves. 
Don't be defensive. Just listen to them. Number five. If you say something that hurts someone's feelings and they call you out on it, don't be a jerk. Pause. Ask yourself why you said what you said. Acknowledge where you did wrong and apologize. Number six. Talking about microaggressions is hard, but if you want the normalization of racism to stop, you have to have these conversations. When it comes to racial oppression, it really is the little things that count. Key Insights from Chapter 13 Number 1. The United States is a country that was founded on the principle that all men are created equal. However, people of color have always known through experience that this was a thinly veiled lie. Number 2. The older generation were told that if they worked hard, they could have a good life. But that didn't happen, because the system is still racist. They've seen that nothing has changed, and they aren't happy about it. Number 3. Kids of color in schools are angry because they are tired of being used and abused by the people who are supposed to be taking care of them. They want to be treated with respect. Number 4. Our role as the adult generation in society is not to shape the future, but to trust that if we would just stop trying to control them and instead support them, they will eventually find their way. Key Insights from Chapter 14 Number 1. The model minority myth is a racist stereotype that says that Asian Americans are smarter, harder working, better behaved, and more successful than other minorities. It's harmful because it places undue burdens and expectations of Asian American youth and erases any who struggle to live up to them. Number two. On the surface, statistically, the model minority myth does not seem like a myth. But Asian American sociologists, psychologists, educators, and activists have helped shed light on the real harm that it does. Number three, the model minority myth does not take into account the extreme educational disparity between East and South Asians, the limits on professional success, and the rising hate crimes against Asian Americans that tie in with Islamophobia. Number four, if you want to fight racism in America, you have to fight the model minority myth. We cannot win this battle against racism if we do not realize that there is no set of racial or ethnic stereotypes that will set us free, no matter how appealing they seem on the surface. Key Insights from Chapter 15 Number 1. A quieter, gentler voice does not bring a quieter, gentler world. All it does is give people the impression that people of color are okay with living like a second-class citizen. Number 2. If you believe in justice and equality, you believe in it all of the time, for all people, those you like and those you don't. Number 3. Tone policing is when the privileged person in a conversation or situation about oppression shifts the focus of the conversation from the oppression being discussed to the way it is being discussed. Number four, to refuse to listen to someone's cries for equality because their language doesn't make you comfortable is a way of asserting your dominance over them. Number five, if you are a white person concerned with fighting against racism and you want to avoid tone policing, remember to be aware that you may not fully understand the pain of racism to not distract from the goal of fighting racism, to build tolerance for discomfort, and never to give up. Number six, if you're a person of color being tone policed, remember that nobody has the right to tell you what you can and can't say about racism. You're allowed to be angry, sad, or afraid. Key Insights from Chapter 16 Number one, to many white people, there is absolutely nothing worse than being called a racist and they might start insulting anyone who points out a racist action they do or thing they say. Number two, it's not easy for people of color to call out racism. When we decide to talk about these things, not only are we having to confront our own feelings of hurt, disappointment, or anger, we know that we are also risking our friendships, our reputations, our careers, and even our lives. Number three, people have good qualities and bad qualities. Being called racist is not a judgment of your whole character, and you shouldn't feel offended by it, but try to find out how to fix it. Number four. If you're white, you were born and raised in a racist society. You are taught racist things, have racist thoughts, and act in racist ways, whether you like it or not. But it doesn't have to mean you're a bad person. Number five. If you have been called racist, it's an opportunity to move toward the person you truly want to be. Number six. If you've hurt someone, the first thing you need to do is listen to them. Don't talk over them. Don't tell them they're wrong. Just listen. When you're done listening, apologize. If they don't want to talk about it anymore, then you should respect that and let it go. 
Number seven. It may hurt to be called racist, but the person who called you racist was hurt first by your actions. Do not fear those who bring that oppression to light. Do not fear the opportunity to do better. Key insights from chapter 17. Number one. As a person of color, you should not feel obligated to work with or talk to racist people unless they are willing to take some action and fix their behavior. Number two. If you want to talk about race, there is plenty of opportunity to do so. But it is easy to get caught up in this talk and think you are doing so much more than just that. Talk. You need to take action. Number three. Until we have dismantled the system of white supremacy and racial oppression, we will always need to talk about it. As you continue to have these conversations about race, you will see opportunities for action and use what you've learned from your conversations to make that action more effective at dismantling oppression. Number four. People should talk and act at the same time because people have been waiting far too long for their chance to live as equals in this society. Number five. Some small steps you can take to help create real change in the fight against racial oppression are voting locally and asking for racial justice, bearing witness to any racist actions and defending people of color, supporting POC-owned businesses, and boycotting those who discriminate against POC. Number six. Other ways to take action against racism are to support organizations and charities for POC, supporting entertainment and art by POC, push for minimum wage increase and police reform, demand diversity in colleges, and vote for diverse representatives. Number seven, it's hard to change the system, but if we take step-by-step -step actions, we will make a change, especially by being activists and voting out corruption. Number eight, all around the country, people are doing real change with small actions. Racial oppression starts in our homes, and it can end there as well. So start talking, not just problems, but solutions. We can do this, together.